In this third lecture, Dr. John Battle is going to instruct us on the post-tribulational coming of Jesus Christ. Dr. Battle is the Theology and New Testament professor at Western Reform Seminary, and this is an important topic because it is this topic, in some ways, that gave birth to our seminary, because Dr. Battle had to resign from a previous institution because he came to believe in this position. One of the great things that Christians hope for Perhaps the greatest thing is when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory in heaven and we all go to meet him in the air, as Paul said, or we are raised up from the dead and meet him. We have these wonderful words in the epistle to the Thessalonians from the apostle Paul in chapter four, where he talks about this. He says, we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This event is referred to often as the resurrection, resurrection of the dead. And for those who are alive and are caught up to be with the Lord, that's often called the rapture from the uh, Latin term to be caught up, to be taken away. And here we see the Apostle Paul tells us that we can comfort one another by thinking about the t coming day when there will be this resurrection and rapture. Now, we are looking at the topic of the post-millennial, excuse me, the post-tribulational rapture, which means that this rapture takes place after a time of tribulation. Now, as we know, when we look in the scriptures, there are many verses and passages that speak about prophecy in the future events. And some of these need to be uh, are, are studied carefully. They need to be compared with each other. And sometimes they're not really clear at first. And many Bible scholars and Bible students dispute and debate about different events that will take place in the future. And this whole area of the future events, eschatology, is quite controversial among Christians who believe the Bible and are trying to understand the Bible. There are some who say that the next thing to happen for the Christian is this rapture, that we need to be looking forward to this rapture, which will happen at any time. And then after that rapture takes place, there will be a time of great tribulation in the world. And so that's referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I believe, and uh, many others believe in what's called the post tribulation rapture, that this great event of Christ's coming and our being caught up to be with him will take place after a time of great tribulation. So this leads us then to look at this information in the Bible about the tribulation and about the future rapture. Now, we know that the Bible predicts that there will be a time of future tribulation, tribulation, trouble, it's referred to many times in Scripture. For example, in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it's called the coming time of Jacob's trouble. But after this time of Jacob's trouble has passed, it says, I will break the yoke from your neck, burst your bonds, and you will serve the Lord and David your king, whom I will raise up. So this is a prophecy of the end of that time of Jacob's trouble. In Daniel chapter 7, the prophecy shows a series of kingdoms arising from uh, the earth, and the fourth of these great kingdoms persecutes the saints, and a great ruler arises and speaks against God and against God's saints, but God puts him down. He is defeated by this Messiah, but there's a time when he rules when there is this trouble, this difficult tribulation. In Daniel chapter 9, it speaks of the future there, and God divides it up into a series of seven 
uh, sevens, a series of sevens, 70 of them. But the final one, the final seven, or the final week as it's called, normally is understood as a seven year period. And we read in Daniel 9, verse 27, that this wicked ruler who will come will confirm the covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. So there is a seven with middle point where this great desolation takes place. In Daniel chapter 12, we read that there will be a resurrection of God's people, but there will be a time of trouble prior to that. And in uh, Daniel 12, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. These prophecies set up a situation in the New Testament where Jesus Christ and the apostles and the early Christians had scriptures to work with, but they also had additional revelation given to them by the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God through the prophets. When Jesus preached on the Mount of Olives to his disciples, uh, telling of things to come in Matthew chapter 24 and in the parallel passages in Mark and Luke. He spoke there of a great tribulation that would come. Here's what he says. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. For then there shall be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And then he continues, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So before the Lord returns, there is this great time of tribulation, and his return is immediately after those days of tribulation. We know that the Apostle Paul speaks of the last events several places in his epistles, most prominently in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And uh, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there the Apostle Paul speaks about the man of sin who will come and who will rule for a time, destroy uh, people and persecute God's saints, but how God will, when he comes, deal with him and kill him and he will be judged and God's people will find relief from their suffering. Here, here are his words. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. This is a future time of great trouble and distress, but the Lord Jesus comes at the end of it and delivers his people. In the book of Revelation, we have many chapters devoted to the cycle of judgments on the earth and rebellion of the earth and the final days before the coming of Christ. Uh, there are three great series of pouring out of uh, the, the, uh, the vials or the, the uh, bowls upon the earth. We also have trumpets 
and uh, then the bowls, the big bowls poured out at the end. And these are symbols of great judgments that God will bring on the earth and uh, will bring punishment to the rebellious and wicked. At the end of each of those series, there's a reference to the fact that Jesus will come and establish his kingdom on the earth. Now later, uh, Professor Lynch will be speaking about the promises of the kingdom that will come, and uh, the book of Revelation has these cycles ending with the introduction of that great kingdom. But before that kingdom comes, before uh, the judgments are finalized, we have this time of great trouble. So the, the early Christians, and you can study the earliest church fathers, writings that have been left to us, most of them uh, believed that they would go through these times of troubles and then would uh, have the coming of the Lord and then would enjoy this great kingdom. And that's what we often call historic premillennialism, or uh, that there will be this great kingdom after the coming of Christ. So Christ's coming is pre, it's before this great kingdom comes. And that's a wonderful hope for the future. And in that kingdom, there will be uh, the people of God, the Israel of God. And uh, already uh, you've, you've seen the, the lecture uh, that tells about how we are one people, the New Testament and the Old Testament. And uh, President Lero has presented that with the scripture evidence for that. And we're so glad that we are joined together with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as one people. And we will all together rejoice in that great kingdom. There is a, a question then of when does Jesus come related to this tribulation? Now, most Christians have believed, as we said, that he comes at the end of it. As we go through the tribulation, then Jesus comes and we have the resurrection and the rapture. This is the view not only of historic premillennialism, it's also the, the belief of most other Christians as well, that after this time of trouble, then Jesus comes and we have the resurrection. The saints are caught up to be with the Lord. So it's wonderful that all these different views are Christian and uh, held by Bible believers. And uh, we should really fight the liberals, those who deny scripture. But when it comes to disagreements about es eschatology and prophecy, I think we need to be uh, very uh, modest and careful and not be overly critical of those who disagree with us. Uh, many of us uh, through the years have actually had different opinions about some of these matters. And so if you really criticize somebody too harshly, you might actually be criticizing yourself because you may believe that later on in your life. So it's good to be a little careful about uh, criticizing and being intolerant for these matters of prophecy and eschatology. We do know that God will take care of his people and that we can rest in him regardless of the events that will transpire. There are some who hold that this time of trouble has already passed, and that's called the, the preterite view. And there are some Christians who believe that when the Romans came and conquered Jerusalem in AD 70, that they were fulfilling uh, these particular prophecies regarding times of troubles and things like that. There's a sort of a mild form of this, which uh, many Christians hold to, uh, but then there's a very extreme form where all of prophecy was fulfilled at that time, which of course would not be uh, acceptable for those who understand scripture. There is a group of people though, and uh, this, this is something that uh, uh, Pastor Lero discussed, uh, that are dispensational, who hold that there is a group of people of God who are in a different program from all of this. That the New Testament church is a separate body from the people of God in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, and even the people of God during the future kingdom age. That those are the Jews, the Israel as a nation, but that the New Testament church is a separate group and that they have separate promises. And one of the promises that this special group has, according to that view, is that they will not have to live through that time of tribulation. That Jesus will come for them prior to that time of tribulation and take them up into heaven in what's called the secret rapture. 
and that Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 was talking about that secret rapture. So if you're a Christian and you're on the earth and history is developing and this antichrist figure, this man of sin is developing and things are getting really bad and they're heading into this time of great tribulation, if you're a, a Christian, all of a sudden you'll be snatched away into heaven with, by Christ. You'll meet him in the air, but it's invisible. Nobody will see you leave. And then you'll be taken into heaven for uh, seven years. Some would say a little shorter time, maybe three and a half years, but you'll be taken into heaven and uh, be there in the presence of God while all of this terrible judgment takes place. And that view is often called the pre-tribulation rapture. That is the rapture of, oops, excuse me. That's to stop waving my arms around. <laughs> the, the rapture then takes place before the tribulation, according to that view. So what I'd like for us to think about just right now is uh, some of the arguments that might be used to um, promote that idea. We might call this a, a dispensational view, although there are some people who are not dispensational who also believe that there is a pre-tribulation rapture, and they base that belief not on their theology, but base it on some Bible verses that, that they think teach this. So uh, you can be a pre-tribulation rapture person and still be not necessarily totally dispensational. And I believe there have been many uh, people like that, especially in our denomination in times past. Well, dispensational theology, as you've probably already heard, uh, began probably most strongly with John Nelson Darby, the Bible student and theologian, Irish, who uh, was actually an Anglican clergyman living in Ireland and uh, trained there. A very brilliant man, a great scholar of the Bible. He translated the entire Bible uh, from the original languages, studied very carefully, and uh, gradually came to the position that the whole clergy, all the ministry was really a bad thing to do. It was it was not biblical, it was not in accord with New Testament teaching. And so he left the clergy and became a leader in the Plymouth Brethren movement in England and then later uh, in other places around the world. Uh, he traveled extensively. But he developed the idea of dispensationalism as a theology. And basically it teaches that Israel and the church are two distinct peoples and have different promises, different purpose, and a different future. I heard one dispensational preacher one time say that the Jews will have green t-shirts and the church will have blue t-shirts through all eternity. <laughs> and that's sort of the, the way he put it. But that there is this, this distinction that is basic. Um, whenever the Bible uses the word Israel, he said it always refers to this national Israel. It never refers to us in the New Testament. And we believe that Paul teaches that we're part of Israel. We're grafted into that tree of Israel. And so God considers us as Israel. But the dispensationalists would not accept that idea. And so there are two plans. Israel's plan is that they will have to go through this tribulation period. But the church's plan is that they will be snatched away before that tribulation begins and will live in heavenly glory instead of on the earth during those years. So this is why uh, they would teach a pre-tribulation rapture. Now there are several passages of scripture that they often will use uh, to support that view. Uh, they'll say that it begins uh, with Jesus in John chapter 14 when he says, uh, I'm gonna prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself. And then later on, in, as we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 and in Revelation 3, where he talks about, I will uh, take you away from that hour of trial that is about to try the whole earth. So these are a few of the passages, and they're just only a few actually that, that seem to teach this pre-tribulation rapture in their view. The view became very popular in America, and uh, as you know, uh, as dispensationalism became popular, so did the pre-tribulation rapture view. If you have a Schofield reference Bible uh, published at the beginning of the 20th century and then revised by him in 1917, uh, he lays out a whole system in that study Bible 
of the pre-tribulation rapture. The Bible conference movement built on that, on that same idea that we're just looking forward to Jesus coming and taking us away at any moment. We don't have to go through the tribulation. Uh, many Bible colleges, Bible institutes like Moody Bible Institute, for example, and many others were founded with this type of theology and sent forth many pastors, missionaries, uh, proclaiming this idea. Very popular among the fundamentalists back when we were fighting against the modernists. The fundamentalists were often uh, believers in the pre-tribulation rapture and in the dispensational theology. And when I went to a Grace Seminary for my doctoral degree, uh, the people there were, were uh, I guess you'd, they would consider themselves mildly dispensational, but they were pretty, pretty straight dispensational. And, and uh, one of my professors, uh, John Whitcomb, made the statement, he says, well, you reform people, he said, uh, you're, you're, you fall away into unbelief more easily than we do. He said, uh, uh, it's, you'll see a lot of reformed theologians becoming followers of Karl Barth and other more liberal theologians, but you'll never see a dispensationalist do that. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had to think for a while, there aren't a whole lot of dispensationalists that are liberal. Uh, well, maybe one reason is because dispensationalists do tend to study the Bible very carefully and the words very carefully and uh, uh, are not as easily uh, swayed by some liberal ideas. That may well be, although I, I know now of some that have gone into more liberal theology. <clears throat> Popular preachers all over the country. I enjoy listening to J. Vernon McGee on the radio, his old radio broadcast through the Bible. And he was a strong dispensationalist, uh, and um, yet fun to listen to. A good, you know, a good Bible preacher led many people to Christ. Had a great ministry as the pastor of the Church of the Open Door in Los Angeles for many, many years. In our own Bible Presbyterian Church, there have been many that have been pre-tribulational and influenced by dispensationalism through the years of, in more modern decades. The uh, Bible Presbyterian denomination has made it very clear that uh, dispensationalism is not scriptural and that we reject that idea and believe in covenant theology. But uh, sometimes people assume that we're dispensational or because we have had people in our past that have held to these views. As we examine this view, I think we need to understand there are two main reasons for it. One is the theology of dispensationalism, which supports this view, and the other is the exegesis of various scriptures. And I would say that both these areas are wrong, and that we can actually prove the post-tribulation rapture both with theology and with exegesis. So we begin by examining, I'd like to just look at a few of the arguments that have been used for the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, one argument is that because the church is separate from Israel, the tribulation is designed for Israel, not for the church, and therefore the church does not need to be there during the tribulation period. I think we can respond to this simply by saying that God never promises his church that we will be free from tribulation. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul told the churches, he said, you must must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And the book of Hebrews tells of all those who have suffered as well as those who have done glorious deeds because of their faith. And we're called upon to suffer for Christ, to go to him outside the gate, to be identified with those who are persecuted. Jesus didn't say God will keep you from persecution, but he said, blessed are you when you are persecuted. And we should not expect to be free from these things. It's not a sign of greater love. Many say, well, God loves his church. It's his bride. He'd never make her suffer through the tribulation. But the Bible tells us, obviously, that suffering is a sign of God's love because it's good for us. It's what we need to be more like Christ. And as you read through, for example, the epistles of Peter, especially 1 Peter emphasizes this how that our sufferings make us more like Christ and prepare us to be more blessed in him. 
Another argument that's often used is that the church is not found in the tribulation period in the book of Revelation. If you look in Revelation chapter 6 through 19, during these chapters that cover that great tribulation, the word church is never found. And that's true. If you have an English Bible, uh, you'll see the word church is not in there. Uh, matter of fact, uh, there are very few places in the Old Testament uh, that have the word church in the English Bible. That doesn't mean the church didn't exist back then. It just means that the tr English translators didn't use the word church uh, to translate. However, when you get to the New Testament, there are a couple of places that quote the Old Testament that use the word church in that quotation. And obviously in the Old Testament, it speaks of the congregation, of the people, and so on, and it uses the word church in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, of those passages. So we would say that the fact that the word church itself is not found in those chapters doesn't mean that members of the church were not there at that time, or will not be there. There is That's a logical jump that we don't need to make. It does talk about those who worship the Lord Jesus Christ, who follow him and serve him, and uh, who, who testify for Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, and we don't really need any more identification than that to know that these are believers who are part of the church. And as uh, Pastor Lero has said, the, the uh, church includes all those who are redeemed by Christ and who believe by faith in him. <clears throat> Another argument which many have used is that Christians should not look forward to the wrath of God. And we don't need to look forward to the wrath of God. In Romans 5, verse 9, the apostle Paul says, Since we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Jesus rescues us from his coming wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The time of tribulation includes the concept of the wrath of God coming down. And uh, we see this, for example, in Revelation chapter 6. It says, the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? So the argument is, that's the time when God's pouring out his wrath. Christians aren't supposed to worry about the wrath. They'll, you know, they, they won't face that wrath. So... They can't be there. They must have been raptured up ahead of time. And to respond to this, there are a couple things we can say. First of all, that the verse in Revelation that's quoted, the time of their wrath has come, refers to the end of the tribulation right at the coming of Christ. And uh, that's because these three series cycle through to the coming of Christ each time. So the last vial there that's open, or that's, that's uh, shown, shows the wrath of God being poured out at the time of his coming. And that's the final expression of his wrath. Then, but I think there's something more basic even than that. And that is that when bad things happen, everyone suffers. But the attitude of God toward each individual is different. For example, when... Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. It was a judgment for the sin of their leaders and of most of their people. Yet there were godly Jews in Jerusalem at that time who also suffered. And they suffered famine. And many of them died and were taken away into slavery. So when this happens to God's people, how do we, how do we account for that? Does this mean that God is judging them also? Is God judging the godly believers as he is judging the wicked in these great disastrous events? And I think we would say, the Christians would answer, and the Bible would teach, no. That God operates in each of our lives as believers to give us those things that we need to make us more like Christ and to bring us closer to him. And that may be blessings, it may be hardships and sufferings. And there are many examples of that, and the Bible teaches that. 
So I think we can say that if we are on the earth at a time of great disaster and great sorrow and suffering, that that doesn't mean God doesn't like us. It means that God is refining us and chastening us and developing us as Christians for his glory. And he's giving us an opportunity to suffer patiently in his name and to bear witness to him in the midst of suffering to other people. And this is often taught through scripture. And the same time, he's judging the wicked, and that's the beginning of their judgments. It does them no good, but it does us good because of his spirit that is within us. So we would say then that Christians going through the tribulation is not a sign of God's judgment and wrath on the Christians. He loves them and he's caring for them even within those things. And he may bring them deliverance through some great way, uh, earthly deliverance, like he did with the three young men in the furnace, or he may bring deliverance by death and we're taken away from the earth. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 21, be on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all this that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And then in Revelation 3.10, he says, uh, I will keep you from that hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world. So God does promise to keep us, to protect us, whether it be going through these events or taking us away from them. How about the idea that he can come at any moment? Well, uh, the Bible never says Jesus can come at any moment. It does say he will come unexpectedly. It does say the world will not expect him. He'll come as a thief uh, in the night, unexpectedly. Uh, the Bible also says that we should always be ready for his coming. It does say the judge is at the door. <laughs> so we live in what might be called an expectation of his coming. And we don't know all the details. You know, it, I've often uh, talked to my pre-tribulational friends like, I think I'm right, but I hope you're right. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could all be taken up to heaven before the tribulation. That would be great. So if, if that's what God's going to do, I'm not going to argue with that. But whatever we're going to do, God protects us. He's with us. And, but we should always be expecting his coming. We don't know when it will be and live in the light of that coming. Another, oh, let me just mention, Jesus did predict things that would take place before he returned. He said that Peter would suffer martyrdom before his return. When Paul wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians, Peter was still alive. And yet Paul had that expectation of Christ's coming. We know also that Jesus said that the whole world would be evangelized before that great final day. And this was one of the great motives of the missionary movement for the last several hundred years, that Jesus will come when the gospel has gone to all the nations. Some people take a verse in 2 Thessalonians to argue for this pre-tribulation rapture. The verse is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. It says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Well, the, the word there, rebellion, until the rebellion occurs, can be translated the departure occurs. And so some people say, well, that means the rapture. So the man of sin won't be exposed until people are snatched away, the rapture, and then he'll be uh, revealed. But I don't think that's the best way to translate that word. It's, it's rather uh, out of the context. And matter of fact, most pre-tribulation people don't quote it that way either. It's a rather forced interpretation. And uh, much better to take it as the ESV here has translated it as rebellion. We can make additional arguments for the post-tribulation rapture. It seems to have been the view of Jesus and the apostles throughout their preaching. Um, Obviously, uh, there are terms used for the coming of Christ that indicate this uh, uh, great coming as the point that we look forward to, not some secret rapture ahead of that, but the coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the judging of the wicked, all this is described as a single event in many different passages. And uh, 
in this lecture, there's not time to go through most all of these passages, are, but there are many of them. But I want to mention one particular passage, uh, the parousia passage that we read about. The word parousia in Greek means the coming of the Lord. And here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're taught about the coming of the Lord in using that word, the Greek word, uh, parousia, he will come. And uh, in chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 13, and I wanted to mention that Greek word. It's used in several passages for the coming of Christ. It's used in verse, here in verse 15. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong verse. That's why I couldn't find it. We declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and, and left until the coming of the Lord. And then it's used again in chapter 5 and elsewhere in this passage. The word parousia in Greek is, means the, the coming, but it means more than that. Uh, back about 100 years ago, there was discovered a vast uh, dump, I guess you'd say, <laughs> full of parchment fragments that had been thrown away and cast away in Egypt, buried under the sand for 2,000 years. And they dug these up and they found thousands of little fragments and, little, and pages and manuscripts of common everyday writing. It's like if you went to a garbage dump and took out all the papers that were there. And this is what uh, uh, scholars have discovered. This shows us the Greek language as it was actually spoken by the common people in everyday writing, which we call Koine Greek. And one of the things they found were fragments that had the word parousia on them. And they'd also found stone monuments with that same word in other places. And they found out that it means something more than just coming. It means an official visitation by the king or by the ruler. And if you had a parousia, that meant that the king was coming to your city. Uh, it was a big event. They even have documents showing the parousia tax. This is when they would make people pay money to support this visit. <laughs> so if the king was coming, you had to have thousands of dollars raised by taxes to pay for his visit. He would come with all of his court, his retinue, and they would come and then he would occupy the throne of the ruler of that city. If this was an official parousia visit, he would sit on the, like, a, like the mayor's throne. He would sit on it, and then all the officials of the city would come before him and give an account of how they were ruling. And then he would have his army of accountants and uh, other officers come and examine the records to see if all the taxes were being paid to him as they should be and if justice was going on. This uh, resulted in either the mayor and all his officials were praised and thanked for their good service and kept in office, which is what they were hoping for, or if they discovered corruption, which they often did, uh, corruption and uh, wickedness and not carrying out the king's wishes, uh, they would be removed from office and often they would be punished, uh, even executed in some cases and then new officers would be installed. That's the parousia, and that's the word that's used here. And here's Jesus coming to the earth. He sits on the throne, and uh, as, as the Bible says, the throne of David, but he sits on the throne judging, and then all of the people are accountable to him. And we have that great chapter in Matthew 25. We have the sheep and the goats, and he judges. And those officials that are, that are wicked and corrupt are set aside and judged. Those who've been faithful to him are raised up, and those who've been just are exonerated. That's the parousia, that's the word Paul uses here for the coming of Christ. And there's another word that in the same passage, which is the rapture. It says in verse 17, then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And when I was a boy, I used to think that that verse meant that we'll meet the Lord in the air and then we'll be with the Lord meant we'll go back into heaven with Jesus. That's what I thought that verse meant. 
Now, when I uh, had a little boy, my son is now older and bigger than I am. Not older than I am, just bigger than I am. <laughs> but he was just a little boy, and I was walking home with him after church, and we were holding, I was holding his hand, and, and we had just had a sermon on this passage. And he, as we were walking home, it was evening, and the stars were starting to come out, and it, he looked up this clear sky with the cold air and the star, distant stars, and he looked up there and he said, Daddy, he says, do we have to go up there? <laughs> it's kind of scary. That was the rapture he was thinking about. But uh, so I assured him that Jesus would make it fine. You know, it'll be, it won't be scary. It'll be enjoyable. But when it says that they will meet the Lord in the air, that word is another Greek word that they found in these documents. It's the word meeting. Literally, it says, we will go up to the meeting of the Lord in the air. And that word has a similar meaning to the idea of the parousia. So in that culture, and in many cultures, even today to some extent, if you have a visitor coming to your house and they come up to your porch and ring the doorbell, and then you open the door and let them in, that's kind of the normal thing to do. But if this person is especially honorable, you might do more than that. You might actually go outside and wait in front of your house. And then as they come up, you will escort them into your house. That's the idea of meeting. That's the way the word is used. You go out to meet the person that you are honoring, and then you escort them in and set them into their place of honor in your house. That's the word, that's the word for meeting there, epiphania. And this is the word that Paul uses. We will meet him in the air. We'll go out to meet him and then escort him with praise and thanksgiving to his place here at his parousia, where he will judge the earth. That same word is used in Scripture, actually, a couple other places where this exactly is what happens. Uh, for example, uh, Matthew 25, the virgins ring out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And that's what they did. They'd go out, meet the bridegroom, and then bring him into the house. Or in John chapter 12, it says, the people of Jerusalem took palm branches and it went out to meet Jesus, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they bring him back into the city. Also in Acts chapter 28, when Paul goes to Rome as a prisoner, it says the Christians came all the way out from Rome to the form of Appius and the three taverns, little towns on the road, to meet us and then accompany him back to Rome. So that's what we'll do with Jesus. We'll go meet him and then bring him to the earth. It's not like we'll be snatched away from the earth, but we will bring Jesus back to the earth to rule, to establish his kingdom. And that is the picture that we believe uh, most accurately describes the rapture of the church, the post-tribulation rapture of the church. And that's the natural interpretation of all the passages, I believe, where the rapture is talked about and where the second coming of Christ and resurrection are talked about in the scripture. Well, I could go on, but I believe that this is sufficient to show that there is good scriptural support and theological support for the post-tribulation rapture of those who believe in the Lord. And this is what we look forward to. This is when we'll be glorified. This is when we will be relieved from all the sufferings and persecutions of this age, that we shall see our Savior and live with him then forever. <laughs> 